I'm John Graft, and I love Chicago real estate. Between showings, I stop in my favorite places, talk with local business owners, and bring their story to you. This is my Chicago. So we've been here since 2006. And so this is the Chicago International Produce Market, which is over here. And then this is the Chicago market. So these are mostly food distribution. It's produce, uh, food. Uh, we're the only wine purveyors, liquor purveyors. Uh, these over here are industrial condos. Uh -huh. And then this is um, one owner going down to Dearborn Grocery. For the most part, it's a wholesale business to business, but they do uh, sell to consumers on the weekends occasionally. So this is one landlord who rents all this out and these are all individual condos for these owners. Correct. Do you know what those go for? I don't. Yeah, it's probably a lot. Maybe. We, you know, my, my partner and I, um, we're, we're thinking of the next move. Our lease is up in March. And so we're thinking, um, do we stay here? There's uh, another uh, warehouse down the road that we're interested in. And then at some point, you know, we would like to own our own place. And so the industrial condo is a good option for yeah. us. Nice. Let's go inside. Okay. We're only wine spirits. We do a little bit of beer. I mean, we drink more beer than we sell, but we, <laughs> we, we have it in the portfolio. So do you ever get any stuff from any of these people? Yeah, so sometimes, sometimes we'll trade. Sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll trade um, booze for produce or, um, you know, just various things, olive oil. Uh, there's an Asian uh, market wholesaler down there. We'll, we'll, we'll do some trades on some things. So the activity here um, on Mondays, Wednesdays and Friday mornings, it's insane. A lot of traffic. It usually calms down in the afternoons. And so for us, um, our drivers get here in the morning about six. Uh, everything is picked the night before. And so they go out on their runs and they usually come back by the early afternoon, depending on how busy the day is. So um, usually at the uh, at this time, uh, you'll, you'll hear the music start to play. You'll smell a little bit of marijuana in the air. <laughs> you'll see, uh, you know, people drinking, having a good time. So this is like the relaxing time. It's the, Friday, uh, Friday, after one. Friday afternoon. Yeah. Okay. So this is Jose. Hey, Zach. Jose works in the warehouse here. So we have, uh, this is 15,000 square feet. Um, 12,000 of it is usable. And then we have a, an office upstairs that's about, I don't know, J Johnny, you'll have to tell me, but I think it's it's maybe a thousand square feet, but okay. we, can, we can check it out. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a, a warehouse that's racked up. Um, we go up five, so the high volume, items are on eight, level A. And then all of the really cool wines that take a little bit longer to sell, those are on B and C. And then um, when you're at D and E, it's overstock. So some okay. of the, some of the uh, um, higher volume wines, depending on the seasonality, we'll, 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 the overstock will be um, on the higher level. I can't believe so much weight is supported by just a few pieces of wood. Yeah. It's kind of unbelievable. So when you buy these places, do you have to, uh, do you have to supply this? Like, what are, what are these things called? These storage containers or this, these sh the shelving units? Oh, so, I mean, <coughs> these are essentially racks and then each of these is a bay and then uh, the wine is put on pallets. Okay. So the pallet could be a Euro pallet or it could be a standard pallet. And the, the standard American pallet, you can fit 56 cases on it. So 56 cases times two in a bay, you look at, uh, that's, that's over a hundred cases, a little over a hundred cases in each bay. And then when we get to the um, smaller production items, we uh, subdivide it. And so you could have four or five SKUs or items in, in one particular bay. Okay. And then um, various odd bottles. Like this over here is, we call this the Pilsen Cave. So keeping with the French model of like a, a caviste or, or um, someone that has a, a, a wine shop or a wine bar. Is that, what um, a, is that the French name for like a wine store? Yeah, so like you would say um, a restaurant would have a cob and the cob is essentially the retail component to their restaurant where you oh, got can it. buy some of the wines. So a lot of our really rare uh, wines, some of our show pieces kind of mixed in um, when it gets less than a case, we'll put it on these shelves. So at the end of each, uh, aisle, the end cap, there are some of the rare wines that are here. So um, I just like it. I sometimes I'll, I'll post on Instagram, you know, some of the new things and some of the trade will like, oh, I didn't know that you had Lamidia. It, it, it's back in stock or you have Frank Cornelison. 
And so then that sometimes generates sales just by pretending we're a retailer, even though we're not, you know, having that vibe. So we call it the Pilsen Cove. Cool. But uh, it's, it's essentially um, where some of our top, more valuable wines are. And then we have some, some side storage racks here. And then um, there's, sam there's uh, sample racks for the sales reps. So the sales reps will come in, they'll um, put their sample orders in uh, the night before, and then it's staged here by the warehouse. They come in and get their samples and they go out and meet with their clients and, and do tastings and presentations. Do you ever do tastings or anything here in the warehouse? Yeah, we have a big, we used to have a big uh, tasting, a warehouse tasting at the end of the summer, beginning of the fall. And we open up, uh, the warehouse, we have a barbecue outside, a DJ, and we invite our clients in. We bring pallets down in the middle of the floor, and then we put over 300 wines open for our clients to go around, walk around and taste. And they like it because it's not a stuffy sort of like wine prom or like a wine gala in a hotel room. It's like, it's more of an open house and they get to see the vibe of the business. Feel really real. Exactly. Yeah. They, they can see, they, they like see wines that maybe they didn't know about it. it, it stirs conversation and they come and go as they please. And then we're grilling sausages um, outside. And it's, you know, we've been lucky. It's usually a nice day. We didn't have one last year because we were, um, we converted our, uh, the mezzanine into a warehouse, which I can show you in a little bit. Yeah. And then obviously we miss it this year because of COVID. So we're really hoping to have it next year. And it's usually the third Monday in September. And it's, a, it's, it's our biggest event of the year. And that's all industry people. So that's all the restaurants. And where, what type of businesses do you sell to? So we're an importer and distributor with a license for the state of Illinois. So most of our clients are restaurants and retail stores in Chicagoland area. So we do about 80% of our business in Chicago and the near suburbs. And we have some remote clients out in Rockford, some downstate. So um, it's business to business. We're a wholesaler and uh, we do some business with country clubs. We do some business with private clubs, but a majority of our clients are independent owner operators, whether it's um, a chef owner restaurant or it's an independent retail. We do business with the big chains for sure. Binnie's is, is one of our larger uh, chain clients. We're not really strong in big chain grocery because we have a portfolio um, that's more small, smaller grower producer. And a lot of the big chain groceries, they're dealing with, um, they're dealing with more of the mass produced wines or more conventional wines. And, uh, you know, we have some of those, but that's not really our focus. So I would say that, you know, before COVID, our business was 60% restaurant, 40% retail. And then since COVID, it's flipped the other way, obviously but we've really seen an, uh, a resurgence in small independent bottle shops really up their game and it's, it, it's worked out. So, um, you know, we're not, we're still down for the year, but not as much as I thought we would have been in April or May. Yeah. So um, a lot of the retailers have really come on strong. And then the restaurants over the summer uh, came back uh, uh, and, had a, a, a more limited offering, but they were still working with some really interesting wines and they did carry out in retail options, bodega options. Everyone's drinking at home now. And I see some restaurants that are allowing liquor to go. That's changed. You used to not be able to do that, correct? Correct. And I think a lot of people are thinking people are drinking more at home, but I feel like they're just drinking what they were drinking at restaurants at home. And so what have you done to capture that business? You mentioned the bodegas and the smaller bottle shops. Is there anything else you've done? So we've worked out with our restaurant clients um, a more limited menu, the same way they've had to pare down their menu. We've done the same thing. And we've worked out some aggressive pricing on certain wines where they're not as exposed in some of the grocery stores. So, so people can have a, a restaurant experience with a, you know, a discovery or, or something that they wouldn't see uh, in, in the big change of the big stores. And the pricing becomes a little bit more competitive where you're not necessarily paying that full spin uh, restaurant wine list pricing. So that, that's really helped. Also cocktails to go. We've been working um, with some of our mixologists and some of our partners where um, our, our portfolio is 20% spirits. And so that was hit really hard when all the bars and restaurants closed, but we sell, we have an amazing agave portfolio and you know, we can't, we can't keep um, agave in stock right now. So uh, I think that's a combination of people are buying and they're, and they're doing their own DIY, 
DIY cocktails at home, but also um, the restaurants are doing their own uh, specialties and their own recommendations. So restaurants that have turned into more of a, a retail option, um, that's helped us. But then also they're, they're wanting to work with, their restaurant um, buyers or sommeliers are wanting to showcase um, new discoveries for people to be part of these pairings. And so we're a preferred uh, supplier to them. And so we've really, we've really benefited from that. Okay. When someone wants to work with you guys, how does that work? Do they come to you? Do you go to them? Do you, do you have salespeople that are trying to bring people in or explain the process with me? Well, it's a combination. So, I mean, nobody needs to do business with us. There's more than enough competition out there. And, and you know, this is a really um, astute wine buying market, the, a very knowledgeable trade. But, you know, over the years, we're, we're celebrating our 20th year. And so we have a reputation. We have a strong website and social media uh, presence, and we have those long-standing relationships. So a lot of our business is referrals. Okay. It'll be the assistant buyer will go off on their own and start a new place and then they have a comfortable relationship working with us and so they obviously want us to come in and help them either write the wine list or, or work on the store set but also we're out there just like any other business we're shaking the trees we're cold calling we're looking for opportunities um, we have access to databases in terms of liquor license but it really is just reps driving around and seeing you know, there's construction going on, there's this new thing going, and then we have sales managers that work with the sales team, and we have prospects, and it's like, okay, the team gets together on a monthly basis, and so let's go over prospects. Um, who's calling on this account? What neighborhood is that? So the sales reps have a geographic territory, but relationship really, you know, has precedent over the territory, like if they have a buyer go to a, a new place and maybe it's not particular in their you know, geographic territory in Chicago, they would still call on the account. So I like that. I like that we have aggressive salespeople that are service oriented. Um, they're, very, they're, they're consultant salespeople. So they have good relationships with their clients, but they're also very competitive. And if there's a new opening, they wanna be a part of it. So that, that really helps out. When you get out to the suburbs, it's a little bit more regional where reps have a territory because they live in the territory and there's we don't have more than you know two reps in the same sort of like northwest suburban territory or western suburbs and so they have um let's say it a little bit easier in terms of opening up new business but there's a little bit less action in the suburbs versus the city so when something does open they know about it and 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 usually um i mean hopefully we can't open up every account but usually they're ahead of the game and they and they get us in there so let's say a big chain, not a big chain, like a big organization like Lettuce Entertaining is opening up a new restaurant. Are, do they have one buyer for all of Lettuce Entertaining? Do they have one wine buyer or liquor buyer for just the restaurant itself? How does that process work on the other end for the establishments? Do they have one person creating a menu? Well, with, with a group as, as big and as successful as Lettuce Entertain You, it really depends on the type of establishment. So some of their fast casual or some of their um, chain restaurants, there is centralized buying. And then they have managers that will execute based on a core list. Some of those managers or wine buyers will have freedom to introduce some new things. But it's really the, the lettuce center for us, for our niche, for our portfolio, because we're, we're a premium wine importer. We do really well with the Lettuce Entertain You restaurants where it's a, a chef partner restaurant or it's more of an independent that just happens to be under the lettuce group. Those are the better ones. Well, I, I mean, I think so. But yeah. but like RPM, for example, you know, they have a sommelier that works at RPM Steak and uh, with a team of, uh, of of servers and sommeliers under assistant and, and soon to be a sommelier at a new opening, sort of that that um, major league baseball farm wow, system. Wow, there'd be that many layers? Yeah, there's just, I, at, like RPM Steak, I think there's five sommeliers and two have gone off to, to start other programs. So. For those, uh, for those types of restaurants, the sommelier will have most of the autonomy. There's very few sort of corporate mandates. There's very few sort of like you have to buy this. Uh, that's what I like about lettuce is that you know, they're very easy to work with. Um, they, ha they have a good product. Uh, they place an emphasis on quality and they have a really talented, well-trained team. So that's, that's how they execute. So for more of, to roundabout answer is for, it depends on the, the, the price point, the, 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 uh, the premise, whether or not it's a, a huge chain or whether or not it's like one of their, the jewels in the crown, one of their showpiece restaurants. Lettuce is a good example. How, how big is your knowledge? Like how does that come into play when, when you're working with someone, when you're trying to pick up a new account? How much does it matter that you know wine yourself? Well, I, I think that 
for for our type of business, I mean, sometimes it does come down to what product do you have and what's the price. But I think for for our business, when we're we're dealing with so many smaller producers that people don't know, it's our job really to tell the story and to to have them be discovered. And so knowledge is key so i mean obviously in sales relationships are the most important thing that that gets you uh, a seat at the table but then once you're there you have to to back it up with knowledge of the product so our job is to to make money for our clients we have to deliver a uh, product at the right price at the right temperature on time but it also has to be very good and so we've curated a a, a portfolio that, that we're really proud of it's a global portfolio it's strong in western europe it's strong in the United States for sure, but we have excellent wines from South America, we have excellent wines from Germany. And uh, I mean, basically, with an exception of Australia, I would say that we represent wines from the most important wine regions in the, in the world. And so it's anthropology, it's sociology, it's history. It's not just does you know this particular Trousseau or Pinot Noir go with this particular dish, it's like you have to back it up and tell the story of the vigneron, the wine grower, and the history and how many generations and how they're farming. Are they uh, farming in an organic way? Is it certified? You know, what is the appellation that they've decided to declassify? And there's so many stories. So there's 1,700 different items in this warehouse, and every one of them has a story. And if it doesn't have a story and it's not compelling or interesting, it doesn't belong in, in the warehouse. And how do you find those brands to work with? I mean, you're working with these different vineyards. You're, you tell me, how do you find those people or those organizations, those businesses? Well, in the beginning, I mean, my, my partner and I have experience working for other companies. And so we had knowledge and relationships. But in the beginning, we were trying to, 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 to fill the portfolio and we had a vision on what we wanted for the company. And so we were out basically going out to California, going to Europe, going to fairs and meeting people and trying to put together a portfolio. So it was harder in the beginning because we weren't as established, but also our timing was right because we were starting, we started in October of 2001. Things were, you know, post 9-11 were pretty rough, but then there was a recovery. And then we happened to have a portfolio that was global and that was, let's just say, more interesting than sort of like the, the standard options that were out there where it was like, you know, these are, you know, my, this is my French selection and this is my expensive Napa selection. We were going after what were interesting things that were happening in South America and Australia and New Zealand and Portugal and Spain. And we had everything moving into the warehouse at that time and we were having kind of a hard time getting it going. But once um, the recession hit, once 2008 hit and price points went, basically were cut in half and collecting was down and consumption was up and people wanted a discovery and restaurants needed to find values in order to maximize their profit and still hit price points and have the family style concept instead of like the three star, you know, basically the fancy high food restaurant. Got it. When that all happened, it was a perfect storm for us. And then we just, we hit it from there and, and, and didn't slow down. And then we, 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 um, got more referrals of more established wineries. And so instead of, you know, having um, the up and coming producer, we also had that coupled with the iconic producer and then hand in hand. So it's like we have, we have the producer that basically invented the category, but then we have the contemporaries of that producer as well. And so that overall portfolio, that collection, it showed diversity. It also showed, you know, respect for tradition, but then also producers that were doing more innovative things at the same time. And so when sales reps were making presentations or retailers wanted to open up a shop and have something to say they were looking to us instead of some of the bigger liquor companies that had you know a more i want to say more of a basic uh portfolio but kind of like what everybody already knew i feel like you need a lot of chutzpah to open up a business like this i think of regulations licenses it's very intimidating for me how was it why did you decide to open this type of business well, I mean, the, the, how I got into it was I, I was a, 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 a wine geek. I, w I was a wine, you know, aficionado or hobbyist or just someone who was really into it. And I just, I wasn't happy uh, in my old job. I wasn't happy in my career path. And I decided, I said, you know, I, I think I, 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 I don't want to stop um, learning about wine. It would be wonderful if I could also make a living doing that. And so I just got lucky. I got a job with a startup company as, a, as a, a sales apprentice of a, of a small startup wine company in the early 90s, and they became very successful. And so I was with them for about five years where I met my partner, and then he left to do other things with his family business, and I left to start my own 
business I was doing consulting within the industry. And then we ended up full circle collaborating on this concept to start our own, start our own business. So we had the experience from startup in wine import and distribution. We had the relationships with the restaurants and the retailers and some of the suppliers. And then we both did other things and we learned perspectives. I, I worked for a really, really big independent retailer called Sam's Wines and Spirits, which is like the Harvard of retail essentially. And then my partner, Mark, uh, he, his family business was um, in uh, the car dealerships. And so he definitely had the customer service and, and, and the sales acumen and the management of the business together. And then we ended up just, um, just collaborating right before, or just right after September 11th. And so we had nowhere to go but up. It was a really good time to start. Um, we didn't have a history to chase and we didn't have that huge debt or that huge inventory. And, and you know, over time, it just sort of built up to where we're at right now. But it's really not that complicated of a business. I think that a lot of people are intimidated by wine in general. And so maybe that extends over to the business. This is basically distribution. It's about relationships, service, and a whole lot of logistics. And the logistics will kill you because the margins are really, really thin. Okay. In wine retail, there's a certain margin. I mean, basically like from someone who makes the wine to someone who drinks the wine um, or, or sells it to a consumer, whether it's a store or a restaurant, the people that have the most risk are the people that make it because they're dealing with weather and farming and debt and the cash flow and they have to hold on to the product. And then restaurants also have, and in, in now more than ever, we're realizing that, restaurants have the second biggest risk because they have rent. Now they have situa situations like COVID that they have to deal with. And they also have um, uh, sort of a, a fickle and transient business. And then retailers have some risk based on brick and mortar, but now more and more retailers are moving away from that and they're doing virtual wine clubs and they have ways that they can fulfill, so they have less risk. We as an importer distributor, it's risky for sure. You can see all the risks that we have, but we can certainly go find the market. You know, we don't necessarily, we're not waiting for somebody to come and find us. We can go out and find the market. And then brokers or agents that um, sit on top of it with like, let's just say the, the, the fourth layer of the three tiered system, they have the least amount of risk because they don't physically touch the inventory. They're more of an agent and they're basically um, get paid on a transaction of the sale. So for our business, it's easy in Illinois to get um, an import license. Uh, it, 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 it's not that expensive. You can be an importer and distributor. Um, you have to have a physical location. You can't bump the dock. You actually have to have, the product has to come at rest here. You say bump the dock. Well, uh, so, sometimes in, uh, it, it, let's say that uh, certain states or, or certain uh, transactions, there's a big grocery chain that they, they bought a thousand cases of wine and it comes into a port, uh, let's use New York for example, and it has to actually uh, come at rest in that warehouse. And then from there, then it can, can get delivered. So that avoids the way, that, that avoids the situation where um, a big uh, grocery chain would say, okay, I'll take 10,000 cases. And instead of having it go to this warehouse, as soon as it lands, just deliver it to all the warehouses. It actually has to, it's about tax collection. Yeah, I was gonna say, right? So who's gonna, who's gonna get the taxes? Illinois is not a franchise state for wine and spirits. And so we, it's, we're at will. So we don't have a contract with our suppliers. So a lot of times the risk that we have is we're the incubator. We'll make something, we'll, we'll, we'll give a, a restaurant or a retail an idea about something. They'll get it started, consumers will drink it. So we're taste making uh, trends in wine. And then depending on the producer, if they're small, they'll always stay with us. If they're big and they have big dreams, eventually we're going to outgrow one another. And so that's when we get it started and then they can go on to a bigger distributor and they're, they're trying to basically a big brand, a virtual wine that's not from a real place. That's essentially like an idea or a concept wine at a price point, or it's got a dragon on the label or something like that. They're just trying to go to target. They're going to start with us. They want to be by the glass of Blackbird and then 10 years down the line, they want to sell the constellation and you see it at target when you, when you go buy diapers. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> we, we want to deal with, we don't want to deal with brands. I mean, we certainly can build brands and we've done it. We want to build categories and the categories, in my opinion, that are the most sustainable are from real people, real estates, you know, real places that have a limited production and that we can basically just say, okay, we're able to get 300 cases of this French farmer's wine. We know where we can sell it. It's going to be consistent year after year. That's part of our revenue stream. Let's add to it.
And there's other wineries that we represent where it's like, how much can you sell? It's a spigot. And that's fun. I mean, that's like an ATM and, you, and it's fun. And you're, you're basically, you're, you're, you're smoke, you're basically like getting high in your own supply for a couple of years. And then eventually if you can't keep up with that growth, they leave you. So you have to have the next wine behind it. Otherwise you take a dip in your revenue when they leave you. Certain states, certain wine wholesaler importers, they're fortunate enough where they have franchise states and contracts. And if that winery leaves, they get paid two times one time GP, really? two times GP. So that's their insurance policy against- Why I'm would gonna, the state be involved in that decision making? Well, I, you know, each state has a different liquor uh, control commission. Illinois is pretty easy to do business with and the taxes are relatively low. There are certain states where the state controls liquor. Like I wouldn't be able to sell liquor. Like Texas, for example, the state controls the liquor. It's, um, it has to go to a retail shop and the retail shop has to actually sell it to the bar. Really? Yeah, so that, that seems so backwards. Yeah, it's very backwards. And then there are certain states where liquor, you know, Pennsylvania, for example, wine and spirits only go through state controlled liquor shops, but you can buy wine through a wholesaler if you're a restaurant. So in Philadelphia, amazing restaurant scene outside of Philadelphia, horrible wine scene in retail. <laughs> so, you know, just like there's 50 states and I mean, that's the, the good and bad thing about the US and every state has a different law and with the three tiered system, which we're in, which is basically, um, it's a tied out situation. It's a post prohibition situation is that the, you cannot, there are very few exceptions where you can make the product, you can distribute the product and you can retail it to the consumer. California, a very strong wine industry. They're the exception. There are wineries that they make it, they have a retail tasting room, they have a direct to consumer business, but they also do their own distribution and direct sales in, into, into um, you know, larger cities. That license in California, in my opinion, is the holy grail. Yeah, that, that, everything. That's a very good license. And they can also, and they can also do importing at the same time. Certain states, there's a clear separation. I don't know if it has, if it's a coincidence that Illinois and Chicago is the one that has the, the clearest separation to, to prevent any sort of like corruption or any sort of like potential for organized crime. But, but I cannot own more than 10% of another tier. I cannot own a restaurant. I can be an investor really? in a restaurant because I have, a, I have an import distribution yeah. license. I can be a 9.9% .9 investor in a retail store or a restaurant, but I can't own over 10% and they really want a separation between the tiers. And you know, it works both ways. A retailer can't all of a sudden, Vinny's all of a sudden can't say we're an importer. We're, you know, we don't need you anymore. We've got our own French, French brands. Now they- huge for you. Yeah, they right. have captive importers. I mean, they have importers that, you know, they, 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 they clear wine or, or, or certain retailers will have a, a, a friendly importer where they bring in exclusives and that's totally normal and totally fine. But it's a situation where um, a restaurant can't be a distributor and a distributor can't be a restaurant. If I, I'm a free trade person and I think that all of those laws should go away. And when that happens, there'll be a gold rush. Everyone will want to have all those different licenses. But at the end of the day, people will do what they're good at, like they do in London, where it's like you can own all those licenses, but they have strong restaurants, strong importers, strong retailers, and the best ones don't try and do everything. So you've been doing this for 20 years. Are people going to you or are you going to, that, to them to find the wine or the spirits at this stage? Or is it both? It's both, it has to be both. I mean, we don't wanna rest on our laurels, but, but there, as you can see, there's no shortage of product that we have to sell. Yeah. But we also have to continue to introduce things and to innovate and to be on the edge. Our job is to bring new and exciting things to the market. Like what's this? Oh, this is cool. So this is wine and fruit. So grapes and fruit in a can. And wine and can in general, I don't know if it's the, the, the new preferred packaging, but every couple of years there's, you know, alternative packaging that comes out. It's like, well, maybe this is the year that it's box wine. Maybe the year that this is uh, gonna be, you know, wine in a canister, but wine and can, I think is here to stay. Yeah. Um, the recyclability is interesting. I love all these labels. Yeah. I love the, like, all the beer places, all the wine places, they can just create new labels all the time. They're not printing on the can itself. They print out these labels and they can stick it on. And the creativity on all these labels has gotten so fun. Yeah, I think they borrow a lot from the micro, the, the micro beer industry where they can come out with different flavors or different options. But this is from Vermont. Okay. So Krista Scruggs from Zaffa Wines. She's a, a 
a wine producer. She also does cider, and then she likes to do the combination of grapes with wine with fruit to do like a, a fruit wine. This is called Pretty in Pink. So this is a rosé style that's slightly sparkling. Okay. And uh, it crushes. So so she had another um, uh, wine in can come out called Melon Drop, and it had a little bit of watermelon mixed in with uh, some grape varieties. Sounds good. It was, I mean, we sold uh, 20 cases in, I think, a day. And then we got 50 cases of this, and I think two weeks later, we're about halfway sold out. Wow. So I don't know if it's rosé season slowing down or whatever, but you know, this will be gone. Is rosé season summer? Typically, I mean, ro 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 rosé, people want to drink rosé when it's warm out, but today, I mean, it's mid-November and, uh, you know, it's 65 degrees out, yeah. so, um, you know, there are certain rosés. We're overdressed, almost. <laughs> there, there, there are certain rosés that sell year-round, uh, but, you know, it used to be, uh, it used to be like white pants. You would drink rosé from Memorial Day to Labor Day and, <laughs> and, and, and not beyond that, but we've had extended seasons, so, so now we're selling interesting rosés uh, up until now, up until uh, a couple of weeks before Thanksgiving. So you have a business partner. I think that's very intimidating for a lot of people to put all that trust in somebody else. How do you find that, that how did that relationship come together? And do you think you would have been able to grow it the way you have without a partner? Uh, so, um, Mark Payne, my partner, um, we worked uh, together at a previous distribution company that was a startup. So we met there. He actually was my sales manager um, right before he left to focus on his family's uh, business. And I left a few years later on, on good terms to, to, to learn retail and to do consulting uh, within the wine industry. Um, I think that uh, in our case, our personalities are very complementary. I handle the sales and marketing and he handles the operations, although he does have sales experience and calls on clients and I certainly can, can handle ordering and operations and, and dealing with the warehouse. But you know, we divided up the responsibilities uh, for the company. There's 31 people in the company and it works out to be about half are in operations and half are in sales and marketing. Uh, I don't think we've had in 20 years any major sort of conflict or any major fight. And I, th I, would, I would say that that's mostly because of him, because I'm not the easiest person to, to deal with and he's very patient. But it is like a marriage and uh, you know, I think we have a strong one and, and um, you know, we enjoy working with each other. We enjoy what we do and the people that we work with and the team. And we've tried to create a culture here one of um, you know teaching and mentoring, identifying talent, um, training talent, and empowering them, and getting the hell out of the way. And if there is turnover, where someone will decide to take another position, you know maybe try the supplier route, or maybe um, try another industry. You know we're proud of them as alumni here. Um, they are part of our DNA, our culture, and our identity. And uh, that's just really the vibe that we want to have here, where it's like you can there's a meritocracy and you know you can certainly rise up from any position um to you know a management role or you know you can go from customer service into sales or you can go you know from in the warehouse to driving and from driving to be a merchandiser or a sales rep that's the the idea that we want to have but it's also um it's more expensive for a small business to have this many people because we do have redundancy it's kind of a next man up situation or next person up where you know one of the, the the top salesperson decides that they want to move to California, well, it would it would totally negate everything that we stand for if we went out and hired a mercenary. Like, oh, let's poach the top rep from our competitor. Well, no, that we want the next person who's deserving to take on some of those clients and some of those responsibilities. So it's time consuming and expensive, but I think culturally it works really well for us. So a lot of people want to get out of the corporate grind. They want to be an entrepreneur. They want to start their own business. How did you start with the funding for this? How did you get this off the ground? I see all of this inventory and I'm just like, do you get all this on credit? Is this, this is all fronted to you? Are you paying up front? It, it the licensing intimidates me, but this, this warehouse intimidates me just to know it's on this shelf, where it is, all that. Yeah, so this is about, um... Our average, you gotta do the math for me. So our average case wholesale is for about $180. That's $15 a bottle wholesale. So that'd be like $23 retail. And a wine list, that would be like $45 or $50. There's two- So what do you say on a wine list at a restaurant? In a, in, yeah, in a okay. restaurant. So there's about $2 million worth of inventory here. So divide that by 180 and that's how many cases there are. Um, we certainly weren't this big when we started. 
Um, I originally started uh, with another partner and it was Mark and, and my old boss, Dennis from Vintage. And so I wrote the business plan for Cream and I came in as a, as a junior partner. He was the, the majority owner uh, and, and, and through his contacts and, and through his um, partnership, we raised the money to start the company. And it was a very small company with um, two reps and, and small inventory. And so when his partner sold, he said, I don't need two companies. Do you want to buy me out? And that's when Mark and I decided to buy him out. And so I went from being a junior partner to being an equal partner with Mark. And when we bought the company, um, we had about, I think our inventory was 105,000. Um, so it was the lowest that it had ever been. And then, you know, that was obviously, you know, financed and we got good credit from the bank and a good revolving line of credit. And from there we grew it. But in terms of like how we pay for things, we'll get um, terms from our clients, so from our suppliers. So if I'm bringing something in from Europe and it takes six to eight weeks to get here, then I'm usually paying them with terms of 90 to 120 days. And in some cases, you know, less than that. There are some wineries when you start a relationship. That's, that's a high net, you know, 90 or 120 is high. Well, it takes, it of, of the, let's say it's 90 days. I mean, it takes half of that to get it here. Okay, so you've, that counts, that time period counts. Not yeah. when it hits your dock. No, yeah, it, it's not FOB, it's when it leaves, it, it's, it, it's when it leaves the, the winery. So from California, we can get things in two weeks. And then we have terms with them that could range from, you know, 30 to 60 days. And then we typically get paid from our um, restaurants, we, we typically get paid uh, within 30. Okay. So there is a cash flow positivity to it, but not every wine turns. Not every wine is an automatic. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we try and turn our inventory, I think last year we did six turns. So on 2 million, um, I, that's every other month. I mean, that's essentially the, the 60 days. So is that 12 million a year? Last year, yeah, last year we did, I think we were 12.7 okay. last year. And then this year we're down because of COVID. Uh, I think we're down, uh, we're only down about 15%, thank okay. God. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we can do, uh, I'm hoping we can do about 11.5 11, this year, finish finish strong, but we'll see. We'll see. We know what we need to do in, in, in the COVID crisis mode in order to keep the team together and intact. We knew what we needed to do on a weekly basis. We wanted to string together, you know, win the week, put four good weeks together, cover your costs, not have to lay anyone off, and then repeat it. And it literally is, we used to forecast the year and the quarter, now we're forecasting week and month. And, and now that we're getting ready to go into a really challenging time with less restaurants, more restaurants closing, some yeah. restaurants not even reopening, and who knows when, we're just trying to get to March. And we're gonna have good sales from November and December because of the holidays and just because I think people are going to drink better, they're gonna gift better. Um, we've seen it, our average our average wholesale case has gone up during COVID, it hasn't gone down. I think it's because people are treating themselves and they want authenticity, they wanna drink better. Yeah. So we know, we feel that we can have a good December. We're already having a good November. It's January and February, they're gonna be the killers because we're gonna have all of the receivables uh, all the payables from uh, our one of our inventory spikes, we're gonna have shit receivables from January and February, and that's gonna be the crunch. And our goal is to not lay anyone off, and, and we haven't laid anyone, we haven't, <laughs> we haven't laid anyone off since COVID, and uh, you know, hopefully we, we won't have to when we get really crunched in, uh, in the winter. I hope that happens. It's, it's gonna be very interesting. With real estate, I'm wondering the same thing. There's been this emotional buying for the last six months. A lot of people have been making decisions based on being stuck at home. And I think a lot of people have jumped into larger spaces and some of the prices have gone up in those, but people have been leaving the city. And the question is, okay, in 2021, what's gonna happen? Are people gonna realize that, hey, everything's in the city, you can still do it. It's still where you wanna be. Or are people loving this larger home, more yard, suburban lifestyle that's been created? The suburbs are doing great, the city is not basically. Now, single family homes in the city, they're doing well, but condos obliterated. When you get one of these, so let's say you set up a new relationship with the company. You have that wine, you close the deal. And you're like, do you, does, the, does the sales guy stand up or email the whole company? He's like, hey, we have this coming, like now go sell it. Or do you have people that are already waiting for it and we're hoping that you were closing that deal? Like, 
which comes first? The demand or the supply? Like once you get the supply, do you sell it or do you have the demand and then try and get that supply? That's a really good question. Um, I don't, I still think I, don't have it figured out yet. So, so, <laughs> so there are there are certain wines like this wine right here, for example. Th this is one of the fastest selling wines in the history of the wine company. This is a foundational cornerstone producer to us, and it sits in the pole position. This is the fastest selling wine in the company. It's Rombauer Chardonnay, and we've been working with the Rombauer family since 2001. We actually started right at the end of 2001, 2002. And this is something that has a, a built-in following, but we've done a very, very good job maintaining that following and getting new clients and, 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 and really opening it up and growing with them. We've, we've grown in synergy with them. So this is, the, this is pole position. So the fastest selling wines are on the A level, and this is right by the loading dock door. So number one, if, right if you're here. in this spot, you're looking really good. The number two, Montrose Rosé. So a, a fast moving item. So it really depends on, to answer your question, it depends on what is the establishment. So for retail, it's a little bit more predictable because they only have so much shelf space, they know what they want, you're gonna get a fraction, hopefully more than a fraction of the, of the wine list, of the, of the selection. But with restaurants, we have restaurants where we have 100% of the list. Really? We have restaurants where we have half of the list or maybe one third, we're a preferred vendor. And so, you know, we're coming in with, uh, you know, being one of the top three wholesalers. And it depends, is it a Spanish restaurant? Is it Italian? Is this a wine bar? And so we're making presentations. Uh, most of it is based on what we would, um, you know, what the, what the client is saying that they want. We listen, we're not the pushy company that says, you know, you have to have this. We're, we get excited about things and show it to them. But at the end of the day, we're dealing with professionals and a lot of them know what they want. So we listen, we, we do the presentation. And then when there's a selection, and other rounds of selections, like we make the first round, they're gonna open in a couple of weeks, they got delayed, they didn't get their um, liquor license yet. Hey, um, the wine that I was gonna get from your competitor is out of stock, do you have something in this price point? And so once we have that set and the restaurant is up and running, it's very challenging to be out of stock on something. We overstock, so when someone's pouring it by the glass, it's there for the season. Oh, that's a hard position for you. It's very difficult because we're a six, we were a 60% on-premise co com company with all of those wines by the glass, and we have to make sure that we have more than the run rate, and we have to pay for that yeah. before the terms. And so there's a cash flow negativity to that, but also it's logistics, and you get it into, we have, you know, a pretty elaborate way of analyzing things and taking a look at it with the portfolio managers and Mark and myself and the sales reps communicate. You know, I just got this placement um, I, by the glass. They think that they're going to go through so many cases in a month. You know, everyone overestimates sales reps. They overestimate. And, you know, we try to temper that a little bit. But in the beginning, you know, you're going into a blind. And so there's that blind faith. So it really depends on how you back up the inventory depends on how busy the account is? Is it new? Is it a, is, is it uh, um, is it a, a particular themed restaurant? Did they have a patio? Is this a wine for the summertime? So there's so many factors in determining, you know, how you back up uh, the inventory for for placements. You said 60% on premise. What does that mean? So um, a lingo for for wine imp import and distribution is on and off premise. So basically, you have a license to sell to a consumer off-premise would be a retail store because you buy it and then you consume it off-premise. Got it. And then a, a, an on-premise would be a restaurant or a country club or a bar where they have a license where someone can, can consume it on the premise of the license. So it's just a, a pretentious fancy way of saying restaurant or retail. What are some other hot products you have down here? Well, Things this was, like to highlight. This was uh, as you can imagine, this was very popular this summer. Summer Water Rosé. I've seen this. Yeah, I mean, basically, this is like, this is Murderer's Row right here. So <laughs> there's a, there's Sean Miner, which is a, a, a great brand for us. More Rombauer, Pinot Noir from Oregon, Willamette Valley, Runaway Red, Alvaro Palacios from Spain, Sauvignon Blanc from Chile, from Prisma. Um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, on both sides. This is uh, a Cava from, or a, Sparkling wine from Spain, from the Raventos family. This is one of our long-standing 
um, really successful uh, wines and producers. Pepe Reventos and his family. This is the Rosé. They also have a really good Blanc de Blanc. Um, Fortaleza Tequila, can't keep it in stock. So you said earlier you have a great agave selection. What's the difference between tequila and agave? So it's the same. Tequila is made from agave. Most most tequila. There are mixtos where you know they're maybe they're using other products to stretch it out, but I mean that's something that hasn't really been done or has been popular for a long time. Right now, it's tequila is made from 100% agave, and mezcal is also made from agave. So tequila is a town in Jalisco, and and that's where. Uh, they make the spirit. And then outside of that, mezcal is made from agave that could be foraged, it could be cultivated, but it's, um, it's, it's a different uh, production method. So typically mezcal is roasted um, underground and that's the smoke, that's where the smoke comes from and, 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 and the, the fiery uh, element to it. And then tequila is, is roasted in an oven, more of a convection, so it has less smoke. But it, it's basically a caramelization of the agave. Right now, I feel, I feel like every celebrity is getting in, like you hear a new spirit, you have The Rock doing tequila, you have George Clooney that did tequila. Is there a reason for that? Is there, is there, is there a reason that spirit is on? Well, I mean, I think Sammy Hagar was probably the first. He was the pioneer with um, Cabo Wabo. Okay. And I think he sold it for a fair amount of money. So I think, I mean, there are probably other celebrity endorsed spirit products, but he did that back in the day. And he basically was the blueprint of, you can make something by not necessarily owning uh, a distillery. You can be a contract brand or a private label. And I think that's where a lot of these um, tequilas, that's the attraction to it is you can go to a bigger tequila producer and say, we're gonna come up with a brand. We're gonna put it in a really nice package. Our story is, is gonna be a celebrity is involved in it. And that will be popular in social media, it'll be popular um, maybe in commercials or nightclubs or billboards. And then once enough of that is consumed and we have a wide enough distribution or points of distribution, we can be attracted to a larger liquor company and sell it to them. And that's when the payday happens. I personally think it's gross. It is gross. And uh, that, <laughs> I'm glad you said that. That's I, not, I know that, how to say that. It's, that's it's not strange. what we're about. But yeah. with tequila, you can see, you can tell whether or not a tequila is authentic by the gnome. Um, each bottle of tequila has a gnome. It's a number and you put it into a website and it tells you whether or not this tequila is their own distillery or they're a contract brand. So this is Fortaleza, this is the Reposado. Winter blend. There's the gnome. Is that 1493 there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the number of authenticity. If you don't, if the gnome is not you, you're bullshit. So what does that mean? Explain that further. So fortunately, tequila production is transparent. So in Mexico, every tequila has to have a number that shows the distillery in which it was made. And if it's, um, I don't know, movie star tequila, number 108 and you turn around the gnome and then it's like well that's the same distillery that makes patron oh okay this is a contract brand this is a private label which means it's just patron with a different label on it is yeah that, is that right basically yeah do you see that with beers you see that with all types of liquors i know if you're if you are a brand you can get like beer with your own company name on it and it's coming from someplace some private label company do big brands do that as well or is it typical or is that a whole separate business the transparency of where it comes from? Not the or... transparency, the idea of creating a private label product, but put, allowing you to put your own label on it. Yeah, there's, um, wines will do a DBA. So it could say Whispering Springs or Wandering Heights or whatever the hell the name of the virtual wine is. And then it'll say produced and bottled by, and that's a DBA, it's a workaround. It'll say produced and bottled by Whispering Heights, Napa, California. But the real bonded winery is another production facility. What's a bonded winery? What does that mean? A bonded winery, it's similar to the gnome where it's like there's only, I mean, you can have a brand or you can have, you can have someone else make your wine. But uh, if you have the, the tanks and you pay the taxes and you have the bond for the license, which um, is harder to get than just to create a brand, then, you know, that has a number and it's bonded number, bonded winery number, let, let's just say like, you know, 17.3 and or, or 100, 173. 
and that would be okay. Well, this is um, Spotswood Winery from Napa. There, the, 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 it's a it's a winery. You you have a license to make booze in this location. So it's a legit setup. It's the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah. I feel like wine's such an old business. How are there new companies coming together? I mean, people have been on this land for hundreds of years creating wine. Me as a novice would think I should go there. They know what they're doing. They've been experimenting with this, but then new wine labels pop up all the time. How does that, how is that possible? Is it, is it a really creative and new product? Is it good or is it just marketing? I think it's a combination. I mean, there, there, there always has to be something new. Uh, the, there's always the next generation and there are the children that decide that they either don't want to make their parents wine, they don't like their parents' music, and they don't want to make their parents wine, and they want to try something different. So right. some of the multi-generational uh, European wineries will say, okay, we still need you here for harvest. We still love you. Your mom wants to see you. How about I give you a, a couple acres or hectares? How about I give that to you? You can uh, make your wine your way, farm it the way you want. And if it's successful, then you know you can take on more of the property as I retire. That's one way where there's a, 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 a succession and a transition. And there's other situations where it's you know a couple from Paris and they made some money in finance and they love drinking natural wine in Paris and they want to start making it. So they are taking a look at places to buy in France where they want to buy land. Well, if it's in Champagne, forget about it. Most expensive land for wine. If it's in Burgundy, forget about it, unless you're on the, on the fringe. So maybe they go to the, the southern part of France. Maybe they go to the languedoc Roussillon, where there's old vines that are organically farmed, uh, irrigated, and it's still the least expensive purchase that they can make. And so that cluster of these people going to these regions to do something new, have something new to say, but using a traditional way of like growing it and making it, that becomes like something new, but that's not a brand. That's basically a throwback to, we're gonna, you know, it's like vinyl. We're gonna listen to vinyl with wine. We're gonna go lo-fi instead of going MP3. Everyone's going MP3 and it's bullshit. I wanna, um, I wanna make my wine in a traditional way, the way that they did it before World War I, before chemicals, before um, conventionality, before mass production. And there's other situations where it's just greed and it's like, well, I want to make a, um, I want to make a rosé that has blueberries in it and I'm going to call it Blue Rosé and I'm going to have this artist do the label and, uh, and hopefully it sticks and we can make some money. And they make a thousand cases and they sell it to a couple retail stores. It gets a good score from the wine spectator. Then they make 3000 cases the next vintage. Then, you know, one of the Kardashians puts it on their uh, on their um, Instagram, and then the 3,000 cases becomes 10,000 cases, and so on and so forth, and then that becomes a brand that they either own it and continue it, or they flip it. It's a burger that they flip and they make some money on it. So those are kind of the extremes. But in between, there's so many situations where it could be someone who is a home winemaker and everyone really likes their wine and say, hey, dude, you got to like do this for a living. You have to commercialize it. And they say, OK, well, then he's like he becomes the, he or she becomes the assistant winemaker at a winery. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'll work out something with you. I'll help you with harvest. I'll be your assistant winemaker. But is there any way that I can use your tanks um, to make a small production of what I'm making in my home? Because I need a bonded winery to make it in in order to commercialize it. And so that's a way to collaborate and do that. Exactly. There's so many. I mean, that's the cool thing about our our industry is the people are amazing and there's so many um, innovative things that are happening and people that are you know some of the smartest people in the world that decided they wanted to leave big tech they wanted to leave um, pharmaceutical sales they wanted to leave finance they you know and they wanted to do something you know be involved with the land more and get out of the city and 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 do something that's a little bit more bucolic and and that's what that's what I love about it like over here this is a completely different conversation probably a different interview but we sell sake and sake is one of my favorite things um, to consume on a regular basis and you know we work with two major portfolios um, wine of Japan and world sake this is really cool so this is a sparkling unfiltered sake or nigori style cloudy sake that has a little bit of spritz to it and it's really delicious to have with like things that are a little bit spicy because it's that milkiness sort of like cools it down cools, cools, it, yeah. cools down the spice shirakawaga they actually invented nigori style 
Um, it's from Gifu Prefecture, and they were making before uh, this became one of the preferred sakes around the world, that cloudy, unfiltered sake. Is that the Nigori style? The Nigori style. They were actually making it themselves, and it had the consistency almost of like a, a, a Greek yogurt that happens to have Is alcohol in it. Really thick. And um, uh, Mas Takeda's father was there at one of the, 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 the festivals in the 80s, I think, or the, I think it was the 70s. And he was tasting, he's like, I really like this. If there's any way that you could make it where it would travel and it was like a little bit more um, potable, I think we have something. And they actually did it for him and he imported it to the United States. And it was one of the first Nagori sakes and, and it sort of like took off where their other um, producers were doing it. Now it's become its own category. The, the Takeda family, Wine of Japan, they were the first to import Sapporo in the entire United States. They brought it into New York. They ran it from Queens down to Manhattan on the subway. <laughs> and they still are the Sapporo distributor for New York to this day. And they get the first run. They get the fresh Sapporo from Canada right off the line, right to New York. And they've been, they've been um, importing it along with other sake since the 70s. So is there actually any blue rosé, a blueberry rosé? No, I just made that up. They I mean, call it brosé. Bro, I think there is a bro. I think there, <laughs> I think there might be a brosé. Do you want to try a, a white or a red or anything, whatever you have? Okay, let me see what I have in the fridge over here. Oh, you know what might you know what might make sense? Have you had vermouth? I've had vermouth. Um, I like gin martinis. Would you be interested in a in a in a vermouth from sure. Spain? Sure. Okay. So this is uh, mousse. This is from Partida Creus. This is 100% natural vermouth, no additives, no sulfur. Uh, it's, it's made from basically one of the hottest natural wine producers in our portfolio. It's made from all of their rejected wine that's too natty. And then they blend some of their top wine with it. And then they aromatize it with botanicals from around the winery, around the vineyard. So I know nothing about vermouth. I didn't even, is it always, it's never, it's, this is red, but is it usually red? Is, um, some people would call that a, a sweet vermouth. Um, and then a white, which would be the dry. So depending on what you want for the cocktail, this is just its own thing. Have you ever had an Amaro? No. So this is gonna have um, uh, some herbal elements to it. I mean, it's Venice, there's wine in there, but it's not gonna taste like a fruity wine, it's gonna have like some spice to it. Okay, okay. So these glasses might smell like our cabinet, so I'm just gonna <laughs> rinse. And it's in a liter, so you get a little bit more, uh, a little more bang for your buck. And a little bit of, and a little, yeah, you could do a spritz and a little, you could do an orange. That's really good. It's so crushable. So wait, th this is vermouth or wine? Well, well vermouth, is, so ver confused. vermouth is wine. So vermouth is made from wine. And if you have good wine, you can make good vermouth. If you have bad wine, you typically make a bad vermouth. So the base is wine and then they aromatize it with botanicals. De this is so cool. Depending on the, the house it's, style. It's like a drink I've never had before. It's amazing. Uh, This is the cocktail. Yeah, that's what I mean. You can just put this on the rocks. It, it almost tastes like sangria. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. A little sangria-ish. Because, because sangria is wine-based with like fruit added. And so this just, to me, I'm getting like more like, it's like Christmas apricot. It's like, it's got like the Christmas spice, yeah. but, it, but it has like a really good orchard fruit. Yeah. This was sparkling water and a little, little bit of, um, like a wedge of an orange. Oh, that'd be really good. But also like this with, um, you could do this with Vichy Catalan water. So you have a salty water, you have the sweet and the salty sweet. What, what was that? Uh, the, the, the Catalan water of Vichy Catalan. What's that? It's a water from uh, Spain in the Catalonian region that is, it's very salty. Very salty. Yeah, it's not thirst quenching. It's kind of punitive, but like in certain, wow. in certain cocktails, in certain cocktails, it's really nice. Okay. Yeah, and it's just like, and it just makes you want another glass. The acidity, the VA, the volatile acidity just makes you want to have another glass, and it's mouth watering. Another glass, another glass. 
So what's this retail for? This would be 35 retail, but it's a liter. So you're getting 33% um, more. So normally it's 750 milliliters, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it sh wine, wine should be a liter. This should be the size. When I lived in Spain, you know, you'd bring your old bottles to get refilled at all these, I don't even know what you call them, but they just had barrels and barrels and barrels of wine everywhere. But you'd come in with your old bottles, you can fill them up for, you know, three euro. That was fun, it was cheap. And it was very purple, but it was, it was I was 20, what's the difference? That's what it's about, yeah. going to Europe and drinking local wine and not paying an arm and a leg for it and having it with the food and that's what it's all about. So if someone walked into a wine store, would someone ever try and sell them this? I think like there's a lot of education that needs to happen with this. This this vermouth is so good and people that know this producer and wine, it's easy to sell it to them. But someone that doesn't know anything about vermouth or wine in general, they probably, they wouldn't be disappointed, but it's like, you know, you want, you're expecting wine, not a cocktail. Yeah. So it's like, you have to know who you're selling it to. Same alcohol concept? Uh, that one's, I think, 13, maybe? 13, yeah. What's it normally, like 12, 12 and a half? Yeah, wine, wine typically um, will be like 13, I think is the average. I didn't know you had this up here. I just expected some desks. We have a kitchen and everything. Welcome to the treehouse. If you and Tori get in a fight, you can just live up here. <laughs> what are those? So these are uh, bottles that we're doing for sampling with clients in the uh, in the COVID era. Uh -huh. So what we'll do is um, we'll focus on a wine or a spirit and then divide it up and the sales team will drop off and then maybe we do like a Zoom session or you know they'll compile it and do their, do their tasting. So you drop these off beforehand, then you meet virtually. So you're all drinking the same thing at the same time, having a conversation about it. Sometimes, yeah. Okay. Like, so we'll do it with, uh, sometimes the winemaker will zoom in or um, myself or some of our uh, portfolio managers will, will, will do the tasting. But then also um, for wineless changes and for new, new protocols for, for, for tasting out buyers on things, Sometimes they want you just to drop the sample off. And so for us, it's very expensive to drop a bottle off at each. Normally we'd be going around with a wine bag, roll up, hey, check this out, this is cool wine, taste the bottle on it, hey, how's it going? Ask for the order and uh, take care of business. And Do you leave the bottle afterwards? Sometimes, like sometimes if it's, well, I mean, if it's a, if it's a, a situation where it's a VIP or, or um, they uh, need to taste it by committee or they're not gonna taste it later, Taste by committee. Like yeah, that. it's the worst. But <laughs> but sometimes if they do that, then we will leave a bottle. But now because we're getting so many requests for tastings and it's compounded, it just makes sense for us to divide up the the wine. So we basically just will take wine and spirits, line up all the bottles, get the funnel out, divide it up. Um, it's a good seal. Some of our um, our bar partners are actually using this type for co for cocktails to go. So it has a good seal on it, and uh, there's bigger sizes. And then you, you, when you get some, like for example, we ordered from um, from Parachute the other day and they had some cocktails and they had um, theirs in a, a slightly larger size and it, it carried really well. The plastic is a good seal on it. So, you know, our competitors are doing this as well. And it's just a, a way for us to, to keep that relationship with our client going, uh, meet their requests and their needs, but also have it be, you know, economical for us. I was gonna ask, was this your idea or did you already see this in the marketplace? Um, it was actually a member of our team uh, was suggesting it, but we did start seeing when there was a lot of virtual tastings, we started uh, seeing this happen. But I think we were one of the first distributors to, to scale it. So if you're a wine, neophyte, you have no experience, but you want to learn more about wine, what's the best way to start? Because I, I know going to your local 7-Eleven or even local wine store is challenging. You're not going to buy anything at 7-Eleven, but you need some guidance from the get-go, I feel. And, and almost guidance at every stage, like guidance to buy, but then guidance just drinking to understand what you're drinking. Well, I think that the best way to learn about it is to taste it, obviously. Um, I also think like if people have an opportunity to travel, not everyone does, but you know, visit the region and, and visit the wineries and, and visit the, the, the local restaurants. But if it's a situation where you're not able to travel and, and maybe you're not able to taste, I would find a, an independent retailer 
uh, and, and, and develop a relationship with that retailer and they'll eventually get to know you and know your likes and your dislikes and there's, a, there's, there's trust that happens. And if you vibe with each other over time, they can bring things to your attention, things that are within your budget. Uh, when things open up and there's more uh, tastings and it's an opportunity to be social again, there's so many events for wine consumers in this town. This is an amazing town to be a wine consumer in because uh, we're a non-price posting state. Uh, our, well, it means that all of the competitive distributors um, they can sell the wine for whatever price they want to a like situated trade channel. So typically that competition or that volume tends to be lower pricing. Plus the taxes are relatively low in this state. And there's not any uh, draconian rules against, you know, this, re this retail store you can't taste or, you know, you have to have this sort of a license or anything else. It's like, it's pretty open. So we're lucky here. Cause sure. I take all that for granted. I've never thought twice about it until you just mentioned it. But yeah, you walk into any place and they'll offer you a drink. They'll ask you to sample this. And that's one of the benefits of going to a place like Vinny's or even a local smaller wine shop. They usually have something open to try. Absolutely. And this, because there's so many stores and there's so many uh, restaurants and wine bars that are always doing events with a visiting winemaker or a visiting importer. There's so many opportunities for education. And now during COVID, there's so, even now more than ever, Winemakers can't travel and they want to tell their story. There's so many opportunities to sit in on a Zoom session or to do a live Instagram follow. And you know, you can work it out with the retailer, whoever's promoting it and get a bottle of wine or maybe in some cases a bottle like this. And then you can sit in from the comfort of your home and you know, taste and talk with a winemaker from Spain or um, this particular vineyard manager from Chile. And so right now it's like with information technology and just everyone just wanting to, to to share, uh, I, I think it's a perfect time. Books are good, uh, but they're, you know, I, I think if you have to have perspective, uh, not everyone, uh, there, there's a lot of opinions out there. So I think like kind of the standard classical books like uh, uh, Jancis Robinson's uh, Encyclopedia of Wine is good. Uh, I think that there's some new websites and some new uh, social media aspects like Wine Folly is very good. Wine Folly has a really good way of explaining things. Their maps are, are good. So yeah, I mean, I think the best thing to do is obviously taste if you can, travel if you can, but if you can't and you should anyway, find a, a local independent retailer, not, a, not necessarily um, a big box store, although Binnie's is an amazing partner and they are the best and the biggest for obvious reasons, but they don't necessarily carry all the wines. And so, you know, you may want to find, you know, uh, Perman Selections has amazing wines, classical wines, but also like some avant-garde and some interesting things. Um, Red and White is, is, is more natural focus. Diversity Wines uh, in, in Logan Square is also uh, a producer that deals with small production natural wines but you have like all together now in in the ukrainian village is doing good things there's a new place uh, easy does it has a new uh, wine shop that opened up and there's so many wine bars and restaurants that are now having websites or an online store because you know they need help as well and this is where we need to patronize at least till we get through uh till there can be you know more indoor dining and, and open dining there's a lot of different options and i think the pricing is relatively good at all these places so those would be my suggestions um, you have information at your fingertips uh, just don't go down the doom scroll rabbit hole um, I, I would just uh, uh, try and have human contact with a, a preferred retailer first and then they can refer you I like that anything else you want to say well I just wanted to say like I you inspired me with your uh, your business and you, know, you and I are friends and we've gotten together and we've talked about business. And I just, I, what I respect about you is your energy and the way that you want to learn about other industries and not just real estate. And so, you know, I enjoy uh, your videos. I'm actually honored and embarrassed at the same time to be a part of it. So hopefully it, <laughs> hopefully it turns out great. But for you to, you know, be a part of this community in Chicago and then also uh, lend your, 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 your creativity and credibility when you travel to other markets. So it's like, you're not, you're, you're not just thinking about the sale or the number, you're thinking about the bigger picture and how all of the community and the industries relate to each other. And I really respect that. So I appreciate what you're doing. You know, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And that came from the idea that 
I have a, f I have a number of different outlets to, to get business from. And advertising is what people do to get business. If you don't pay for advertising, the phone isn't gonna ring, the spigot is turned off. So I have a, a number of different options, and one of them is to just pay a company like Zillow, give them tens of thousands of dollars, and they will give me leads. And it's quick, it's easy, but it's a lot of time on my feet. And if I owned a factory, if I was creating widgets, that would make all the sense in the world to me, because I have machines that are doing that. But I have to physically go and show all these places, or someone on my team has to, and it's very exhausting. And a lot of people just like to look instead of build relationships. They just want to see a place. And if you pick someone up from Zillow, there's no relationship. You have to really work to create it. And it's a very fickle business like any, where, you know what, if maybe I was wearing the wrong thing that day or I said the wrong thing to that person. They looked at one place with me and there's the whole relationship, it's gone. No matter what credibility I have or what expertise, experience, it doesn't matter. Or I could do something like this, where I can go out and I can promote other people's businesses. I can learn in the meanwhile. I can learn all different things about Chicago. I can go to different neighborhoods. I mean, I wouldn't call this, we're not in Pilsen, but we basically are, right? Is this Pilsen technically? This is the heart of Chicago, which is in between Bridgeport and Pilsen. But I always say Pilsen because it's a reference point. People no one, know no, it. no one is, well, less people are familiar with heart of Chicago. Is that, is that an actual name? I didn't know that. Is that It is, yeah. So the old school Italian restaurants uh, at Western and I think in the low 20s, that's the heart of Chicago. I think Gennaro's, I don't, I don't remember all of them, but that's really where Heart of Chicago started. There's incredible Mexican restaurants in this neighborhood. Yes, yes there is. In, I know it in, for that, in, just that. Incredible, so, uh, but yeah, this is closer to Pilsen than Bridgeport, but this sort of like byway by the river, which is really beautiful by the way, um, right at, uh, at Damon and 55, looking west, it's incredible. It makes me want to get a pontoon boat and just like, you know, hang out in the in, in the Do summertime. Do wine cruises? Yeah, wine cruises. So, <laughs> so look for that for, for, for next summer. But um, yeah, it's a it, it's a it's an easy uh, access. Um, it's low key. We're not bothered. Um, rent is relatively low. We can deliver to a majority of our clients within 15 minutes. Um, the sales team, most of them living in the city, can find parking, there's access to it. So while it's not the, the sexiest neighborhood, we got priced out of the West Loop for our sales and marketing office and we came we here. We first met in the West Loop. I just remembered that. You had that place over there. We, we had a sales and marketing North office. Lake. We were at Lake and Carpenter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Originally in Peoria in 2001, but we were there for, you know, I don't know, 17 years. Uh, dumb enough and underfunded enough not to buy, but you know, that was our sales and marketing office and our warehouse was here. And it was, it was great to combine the two to be culturally, to have the front and the back of the house together, to have the product below you. But after the, the explosion of the West Loop uh, and no parking, I, I, I didn't want sexy anymore. I think parking is the new sexy. So for <laughs> us, we just, we're, we're thankful. You have all to, the space in the world. Here. Exactly. So for us, what we're, what we're about um, and, and what we want to accomplish, this neighborhood is home. I mean, it may not be in this location long-term, but from, from uh, proximity to Chicago and other opportunities in this area, I think this is where we'll be long-term. We just got to get your living situation closer to here. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. You have to talk to Tori about that because I'd be very, very happy to, to move back to the uh, Ukrainian village, which is really close to here. Good, I have one last thing. When did these cabinets go in? Uh, they went in when we redid this office two summers ago. Okay. Cause you know black cabinets are in, lighter countertops are in. So you're right on par with everything that's happening. And I feel like that was an accident, but it worked out really well. Oh no, thank you for that. It was actually uh, our friend who is an amazing uh, interior designer, Steph. But you had Cat. someone do this, someone came? So Steph- Oh, that's awesome. We got to give a shout out to her. She, she was right on trend. Steph Kaslov is an incredible uh, designer. And um, we were very grateful that she uh, was slumming with us uh, to help us uh, do this. But it was uh, through uh, Tori's relationship with her. My fiance, Tori Burdell, and her are uh, our college friends. And so she was really helpful in this, very patient. We were one of her first clients, and now, I mean, she's 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 a star, so. That's awesome, uh, we'll have to uh, meet with her next. In, in the new office, uh, I think we're gonna pay for it. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. These are nice, the, the black front looks really good. These, yeah, yeah. This, this is exactly what people are doing, it's so funny. Okay, that's it. Thanks for doing this. Oh, of course, thank you, Johnny. You got it.